to tonight's installment of URI's Fall 2010 Honors Colloquium on Race. Before we get started, I just want to let you know some crucial information. We have fire exits here on the sides and over here in the back. Men, your bathroom is here back and on the right. Ladies, your bathroom is here back and on my left. Last week, we heard from Kareem Shora, uh, no, uh, Leo Chavez, but I'm losing track, people. We heard from Leo Chavez, and uh, next week I'm proud to announce that we will have uh, Mayor of Newark, New Jersey, Cory Booker, here with us, so please don't miss that. I'd also like to remind you of our Thursday film series that happens at 5 p.m. in Lippet 402. This Thursday, we're going to be showing Street Fight, starring Cory Booker. Now, to introduce tonight's speaker, I'm proud to bring you Professor Pantalone from the Department of Journalism. Uh, good evening. It's nice to see students in the audience, and including some who have uh, used um, Dr. Jolly's films in their coursework. Our guest tonight, Dr. Sut Jolly, took his college education in England and Canada, but he had the good sense to move to the United States, where there is much more fertile ground for criticism of the media. He's been teaching at the University of Massachusetts Amherst since 1985, and he founded the Media Education Foundation there in 1991. It's through that foundation that he has written, produced, and directed numerous films on mass media in the United States and elsewhere, and the effects of mass media. He uh, has written books as well on uh, a number of subjects, including racial matters and racial issues, and he will be talking about some of that tonight. His subject, uh, uh, the subject of his films have included music videos and the denigration of women, violence in film, television, and video games, and its connection to definitions of masculinity and advertising in the consumer culture. Tonight he will address the American conversation about race in the post-Obama age. Please welcome Dr. Sut Jolly. Great, thank you. Um, so a great pleasure to be here and uh, part of this series. I had a quick look um, online at the other uh, speakers you've had so far, and it looks like a very, very um, interesting series. I hope I can live up to what uh, other speakers have done. Um, I should warn you, you may not like what I'm going to have to say, so, um, or you may react, um, but I hope to be provocative. Um, it's one of the reasons, actually, to teach and to give speeches is uh, to try and provoke some response, not purely for the response, but uh, to try and engage people. Now, during uh, Barack Obama's presidential campaign, there was a lot of talk about what the campaign or what Obama's uh, uh, candidacy meant for the existence of racism in America. Actually, for me, it was, a, it was a kind of weird deja vu moment because <laughs> uh, it actually took me back to 1984, 1985, when similar kind of discussions were taking place, but it was as a result of um, the existence of a very popular TV show, The Cosby Show. And people were, all, again, asking, does this, does the, is the, uh, the success of The Cosby Show mean that we're in some kind of post-racial age? when uh, a show based on a black family can be so successful and so popular with everyone. And as you'll see as we go along, I think there are a lot of connections between, between that moment and that show um, and uh, the moment that we went through a couple of years ago. In, 19, in 2008, in fact, it actually wasn't that long ago now, but and perhaps if you can turn your minds back to it and just uh, try and uh, remember some of the reactions to... Um, on that November night and in the days following about what the election of a Barack Obama meant. Um, for many people, actually, it indicated, the election indicated that we were in, officially in, 
a post-racial world and that racism or its most manifest forms had been banished from American culture. Uh, if you don't believe me, <laughs> I know it seems ridiculous to say now, but this is, um, this is the Wall Street Journal the day after. They say, one promise of his victory is that perhaps we can put to rest the myth of racism as a barrier to achievement in this splendid country. Racism is gone. And look, we have the proof. Obama is president. The Washington Post, Richard Cohen, the conservative columnist. Actually, it wasn't just liberals who were saying this. This was <laughs> across the political spectrum. Richard Cohen says, it is not just that he, Obama, is post-racial, so is the nation he is generationally poised to lead. And then in this bizarre kind of ref reflection of the civil rights moment, you know, we have overcome. We have overcome. We are in a new moment. Or an election night, Rudy Giuliani said, and these are, remember, this is, these are not just liberals, this is across the political spectrum. He says, we have achieved history tonight, and we've moved beyond the whole idea of race and racial separation and unfairness. High, high times, indeed. Uh, it made, even made its way, even, even, even the Fox News Network, actually, and I do, actually, um, almost throw up when I have to put news in that sentence. That should be the Fox Propaganda Network. Uh, and that, um, that's not an opinion, that's just a straightforward statement of what the function of, <laughs> of, of Fox News is. Um, and you don't need any better indication of that in terms of what their function is uh, other than what they've done in the last two years, especially around race, especially around race. Uh, but this is Chris Wallace from the Fox show. He appeared on The Daily Show. Uh, our best real news program, um, the next day. Isn't it exciting? Are you excited? I am excited. Honestly, I yeah. am excited. I mean, first of all, anybody who was a child of the civil rights movement in the 60s, the idea that an African-American, to watch that family Crazy. walk out there Crazy. last night and to think that is going to be the first family of the United States, a beautiful Black they look like woman. they belong in a and, Sears and, photography and, studio queue. And, Crazy. And, and beautiful children and a, and a handsome, strong, smart, self-confident black man. I never thought I would see it in my life, and I think it's wonderful for the country. It couldn't happen anywhere else in the world. Completely It, it would be like uh, the French suddenly uh, electing an Algerian as president. <laughs> uh, and, uh, no, seriously, it is an extraordinary thing. I hope. An extraordinary thing, like the French acting in Algeria. <laughs> and this is, remember, uh, Chris Wallace from the Fox News Network, you know, and he's now identifying himself as anyone who's a child of the civil rights movement, which indicates he was, <laughs> I guarantee he was not a child of the civil rights movement, but it's now become so mainstream, and you can now say it because it has been, we are now successful, as, <laughs> as Richard Cohen said, we have overcome. So it is the culmination of, uh, of, that, of that moment. Now, however good such statements make us feel, um, on their face they are clearly absurd and illogical as an analysis of how racism has functioned and continues to function in American society. Clearly absurd. For example, Benazir Bhutto was twice elected Prime Minister of Pakistan. Does that mean that sexism has been defeated there? There have been elected female leaders in India, in Great Britain, in Israel. Does it mean that sexism is no longer present in those societies? Well, actually, that argument is not, not even made, but it is made in regard to race. So what I want to look at today is I want to understand what the election of Obama, of Barack Obama, means for how we understand race, for how we understand race in American society. And as you'll see, as I, as I go through my analysis, I actually don't think it tells us very much about changes in the reality of race. But it does tell us something about how our perception of race has changed. And if our perception of race has changed, then so will our policies 
to reality. So not about reality, but about perceptions. Um, and we have to be very precise and specific in the questions that we ask. Now, l- let me make clear, um, actually over the last few weeks I've, I've kind of been developing a different kind of analysis as well, which, I, which I'll be happy to talk about in the, uh, uh, not developing an analysis, but talking about different issues in, in the question period. Uh, what I'm going to be talking, because I think Obama and the idea of Obama and what Obama in the minds of some people represent is absolutely fundamental to the rise of what is known as the Tea Party movement. The Tea Party movement is a, part, is a movement of white people. Okay, it is a white movement. And Obama and the idea of Obama is central to that. Okay, and as I said, I don't want to. I don't want to address it. I, actually, I want to, at the risk of um, annoying people. Uh, I mean, I want to look, kind of look at mainstream views of race. Okay, that how people of, of, of goodwill, people of goodwill may think about race in the age of Obama, not the crazies who are uh, you know, part of the Tea Party, not, not, the, not the extremists. Although, as I said, we can... Actually, they're, they're not that extremist anymore. <laughs> they are now moving more and more into the mainstream. But I want to talk about these mainstream representations. First, I'll start off with some definitions of race. Uh, I'm going to risk a definition of race, <laughs> which in this audience I think will be risky, but you never know. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, the great African-American thinker, who, and I'm actually very proud to work at a university for the last 25 years, uh, where the university, the central university, uh, sorry, the central library, is named after Dr. Du Bois. Uh, but uh, but W.B. Du Bois posed the question of why we continue to structure our social arrangements around characteristics that we know do not matter. Race as a biological category does not exist. As a biological category does not exist. There is much more that is biologically common to humankind than what is different. Humankind shares a common ancestry We are, all of us, Africans under the skin. We are all, our our ancestors go back, all of them go back to to Africa. That's what, that's what the, that that we know that now. Despite the attempt by scientists after, you know, scientists trying to prove it, they have not been able to prove it. Race as a biological category does not exist. The characteristics of what we call race what actually the boys referred to, this, and his definition of race, he said, is the differences of hair, skin, and bone. Okay, the differences of hair, skin, and bone. That is, we look around, actually, you know, we, we are different. Our physical, external characteristics are different. Those are the differences of hair, skin, and bone. And they are merely the, uh, the surface manifestations, the surface differences produced by environmental influences, by env- environmental factors, as we emigrated out of Africa. As I said, we are all, all of us Africans under the skin. And yet, we take these essentially meaningless characteristics and think that they refer to something much deeper. We take these essentially meaningless characteristics and construct our entire social world, our entire economic world around them. Why should this be so? Why should this be so? Actually, the answers are not difficult to find. The reason why we think that those things is because our culture tells us that these differences matter. Our culture tells us that the differences of hair, skin, and bone really are revealing of a deeper reality that is imprinted in our genes. That these surface features, that in race is like a mark. Someone's come along, they marked your skin, they marked your face. And we read, we read that mark through the languages of race, through the stories of race. We read that mark to say these differences actually matter. That depending upon the mark of race, um, it can explain deeper characteristics of individuals and of groups. So we operate inside a system, a cultural system of racial beliefs. 
And racism is when we believe the differences of hair, skin, and bone are the reasons why different types of people succeed or don't succeed. Why different types of people um, succeed or don't succeed at sports. Why different types of people <laughs> are better dancers than other people. Or why different types of people end up in such differential ways locked up in our prison system. The differences our culture tell us, the differences of hair, skin, and bone matter. And we read them through this linguistic, through this linguistic sense. So this is, this is the W.B. Du Bois definition. Okay, the differences are real. Let me, you look around. Right? I don't want to deny the differences. You only have to look around the room and the differences, we can see what the differences are. So there's no point, it's not about denying the surface differences, but about asking how do these surface differences come to take on some deeper meaning. And to understand that, you've got to understand, you've got to understand the culture. So I want to understand, I think there's two ways of understanding race. Okay, we can understand race as a psychological construct. That is, what goes on inside our heads. What do we think about the differences of hair, skin, and bone? It's essentially an internal, an internal uh, construction. And we can also think about race as a socioeconomic construct. That is, how, how are our realities organized through the differences of hair, skin, and bone? And this is what I would call, as I said, the reality of, of race, what goes on outside our heads. And the thing that we need to figure out, and, this is, and, and the question I'm posing tonight, is, it's a very specific question I'm posing tonight, is what is the relationship between the two? What is the relationship between the way race works inside our heads as a linguistic construct? and the way in which race operates in reality. Now, of course, in reality, there is no difference between reality and perception. <laughs> I'm making a distinction for heuristic purposes, um, although I actually do believe reality exists outside of our beliefs, <laughs> outside of perception, but we can't understand. But I'm looking at how our understanding of reality is affected by our perception. And that's, my, that's as I said, my aim is to try and try and come up with some answer to that and to, and to figure out a spe specifically what this, you know, the momentous election, and I think it really was a momentous election, that moment two years ago, I think actually for all kinds of reasons was a really powerful moment of what it has meant in the long term. Okay, let's start off with the reality of uh, the differences of, of, of how the differences of hair, skin, and bone are organized in our socioeconomic system. Okay, and I get a lot of this from uh, some of the figures I'm going to give, or some of the, uh, the conclusions I'm going to give, I get from the book by Tim Wise. Uh, he's got a terrible title of a book. I try to convince him to not do this, but uh, Between Barack and a Hard Place. It is a, it is a terrible title. He could have called it something else. Uh, but he, he really liked it, so he just insisted on it. Uh, so a lot of these things I'm getting from that. Um, in fact, in almost every single um, uh, economic and uh, social dimension of life, um, we can see how the differences of hair, skin, and bone structure it. Okay? When we look at, for example, wealth, income, and employment, okay, whether you're looking at family net worth, whether you're looking at rates of unemployment, whether you're looking at wages earned, at levels of poverty, at the success of job applications when all other factors are held equal, Race is a major explanatory factor as to why the rewards of society are differentially dif distributed through the population. It has been estimated that African American workers lose up to $120 billion a year in wages as a result of labor market discrimination. The differences of hair, skin, and bone do really make a difference in the way in which our reality is structured. Look at housing. When it comes to discrimination in housing, race continues to be a determining factor. Access to rental housing, access to mortgages, access to mortgages with good rates are affected by the color of your skin, by the differences of hair, skin, and bone. You may remember that 
the, the, present, uh, the present economic crisis started off as a subprime crisis. That is, that was, it was a racial crisis. There was a racial, there was a racial origin to this crisis. Uh, the, the, the cost of present-day housing discrimination has been estimated at over $4 billion annually, and black communities have been deprived of nearly half a trillion dollars in wealth due to past and present housing discrimination. If we look at education, okay, and obviously I'm going through this very quickly. You could do a whole lecture on each of these things in terms of, um, in terms of laying them out. In education, access to good education is directly connected to the differences of hair, skin, and bone. Not only in terms of how much money is spent directly, and we know that differential amounts are spent on different children based on, collectively based on the differences of hair, skin, and bone, but it also is impacted, um, uh, education is impacted by other issues as well connected to poverty which get magnified in an educational setting. Inadequate in, uh, nutrition and healthcare, both of those things which uh, disproportionately affect uh, uh, African Americans, play themselves out in education. Uh, family crises like long-term employment. Uh, the, the, there's the emotional and the material toll of growing up poor. With fewer and fewer resources, lower income schools have a tough time attracting qualified teachers. I can, I can tell you, I mean, in one way, my, my own story, just very briefly. Um, uh, when I grew up in England, um, I, was a, you know, I was born in Kenya to, uh, to Indian parents. We moved to England when I was six. Um, you know, so I was in England for, when I was, you know, for, for about four years. And in England, you do something called, uh, at age 11, it's crazy, but you, do this, you used to do this thing. <laughs> you, call, you do an exam, it's an IQ test called the 11 plus. And if you pass, you go to the one good school in the area, which is the grammar school. And if you fail, you go to what was called the secondary modern school, which was the route to the factory and to office work. It was a, it was a very strict class system that was divided at the age of 11. I was, yeah, I was 11, I mean, when I was 11, I'd been in the country four years. IQ tests are very culturally specific. Um, I'm not that smart anyway, and I failed. I ended up in one of these secondary modern schools. And, you know, that was the route to the factory. Because they were being, literally there was a route to the factory because at the age of 16, you didn't, you didn't go, you did, that school stopped at that point. Now it just so happened, this was, it was an accident of fate uh, that I'm here. It just so happened um, that uh, the Labour Party got in when I was 14 or 15 and they abolished, they abolished uh, secondary uh, modern education. They, they abolished the system and they introduced something else called the comprehensive system, which got rid of the grammar schools. They recognized that this was, you know, making this decision. They got rid of the elitist grammar schools. And so suddenly in our, in our area, uh, this happened literally overnight. And one day, uh, the local grammar school that had all, all the middle class kids, <laughs> had all the good teachers, had to join with some school. And they joined with ours. And so suddenly, overnight, we had teachers in our schools who knew how to get you through exams, who knew, how to, who knew what to do to get you, you know, to, in terms of the capital that's, that's required in education. And I was able to, to somehow just, you know, kind of latch onto that. But if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for that, I would be living a very, very different life. It was an accident, it's an accident of fate, and that is the way in which class works. It's the way in which class and race work together around education. If you look at criminal justice in terms of who is incarcerated, again, America has 5% of the population of the world and 25% of the prisoners, the vast majority of whom are African American, Latino, or other minorities. It is one of the, it is, it is an absolute scandal. Actually, scandal is like, I don't even know the word for it. It's an absolute, you know, it, it, it's, um, I mean, for a society to, for a society to carry on with, with those kinds of, with, with that kind of reality is just, is just unforgivable. And again, the differences of hair, skin, and bone determine structurally who ends up in prison and who does not. This all comes together in the image of what we can call the ghetto or the inner city. 
characterized by extreme poverty, serious and violent crime, high rates of drug addiction, permanent joblessness, welfare dependency, and dramatic increases in out-of-wedlock families, births and families, at the central core of many American cities has become a kind of no-go area that requires a constant police uh, occupation. The reason there's so many police in the inner city is not to police what's there, is to make sure the violence doesn't spread out to other areas. It's to contain the violence there. The inner city has become a social, economic, and cultural disaster area with high rates of violent crime, um, unemployment, and persistent unemployment, high rates of incarceration. Okay, that is what is euphemistically called our urban problem. When we talk about what our you know, urban issues, urban, that, that's what we talk about, our, that's the code word for black poverty, our urban problems. Now the topic of my talk is how do we understand this socio-economic organization of society that's outside our heads in reality? How do we understand that along the lines of race inside our heads. Okay, the answers we will give to it, if, that's the, that, how do we explain that reality? How we explain that reality and then how we deal with it or not deal with it will be dependent upon how we understand it. Will be dependent upon the stories in our heads about why so many black people are in prison about why so many black schools or predominantly black schools are such disaster areas. Dep depending upon the answer to that, they will have a policy outcome to that. So we have to look at, we have to look at the stories that are told. What are the stories about the differences of hair, skin, and bone? The discourses of race. The discourses of race. And then, more particularly, how does... How does the election of Barack Obama play into that? How is it part of these stories? Um, the, over, I mean, the overall kind of perspective I'm trying to lay out is these stories matter. And that's one of the things we know about, um, one of the things we know about media influence is that the media may not be very good at explaining behavior, may not be very good at explaining why some people are violent and other people are not violent, which is the predominant story though, that we hear, but the media are very good, are central to how our attitudes are formed, of how we think the world works. And research has shown that the more you are, the more you live in a world where a particular set of stories is told, the more you believe the world operates according to those dimensions. So the more television you watch, for example, the more you think the world you live in is actually like television. The less, ch the less, less television you watch, you have a different view of how the world operates. You, can actually have, you could have two households in exactly the same area, exactly right next to each other, and one household could watch eight hours of television a day, the other household could watch one hour of television a day, and they'd be essentially living in different worlds. They will be living in different cultural worlds because the stories about how the world is organized will be very different depending upon your exposure to that environment. And your understanding of a reality, your understanding of race will be affected by your differential, your differential exposure within that environment to those types of stories. For, for example, the, the, the major issue, uh, let me, let me come, give you an example. Uh, when it comes to the question of violence, which is the major question that's been asked around media, you know, does watching television make you violent? It's almost impossible to answer, the, and the general answer to that, I would say, is no. But one of the things we know is, if you watch a lot of television, you think the world is a dangerous place. You think the world is actually much more dangerous than it actually is, and therefore you are more mistrustful of strangers. You overestimate your, chance, your, your chances of being a victim of, of crime. You're much more scared. You're much more scared. You think the, the world is much meaner. And when you think the world is much meaner, then you will, you will act in the world as though it is meaner. You are more willing to then support 
um, uh, politicians who are tough on crime. You're more willing to support the death penalty. You're more willing to support higher, uh, stronger sentences. That's the way in which media influence, um, media influence works. Actually, <laughs> if, I've, if, 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 if I've convinced you of that, I've just encapsulated about you know, a semester's worth of research into, <laughs> into two minutes of explaining how the media work. But that's, that's, the framework I wanna, that's the framework I would like you to, to use in terms of when I start talking about what these stories are. Because it's not a, I, 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 actually I don't wish it was simple. Uh, the world is never simple. You should always have, your, your, your mode of analysis should be at least as complex as the world you want to look at. And when it's too simple, it's not. <laughs> by, very, by very definition, it's not. It can't be correct because the world is not that simple. So what I want to look at is the stories the stories of the differences of hair, skin, and bone. And I'm going, to, I'm going to concentrate, again, come down to a question. I'm going to concentrate on what, on what the stories of African-Americanness mean. And there are many different stories that can be told here, the different stories around, you know, around Latinos, stories around other minorities, stories of other differences of hair, skin, and bone. Again, that is the subject for a lifetime, a lifetime worth, lifetime's worth of work. But I want to try and il illustrate my, the analysis by focusing in on the question here, which is how is, how, are the, how is the mark of blackness, how is the mark of African-Americanness read? What are the discourses, what are the stories around that mark of, uh, of, of race? And, and, more, and more particularly, how, because there's no one story, I wish there was. How do the stories interact? How do the different stories of the mark of blackness interact with each other? And then how does, uh, as I said, how does Obama fit into that? The first story, the most predominant story that we're told is that african Americanness and the mark of blackness is connected to crime, violence, welfare, and degeneracy. And in fact, until relatively recently, until I would say about 1984, um, the black people were presented almost exclusively in, predominant, in rather narrow ways. In television programming where they appear, did appear, which wasn't very often, as clowns or fools, or as entertainers, or as athletes. Uh, in films and television programs as criminals and murderers or pimps and drug dealers. And there's still a lot of these types of representations, perhaps in different types of media. Uh, this, uh, I'll show, give you a, a humorous illustration of this. This is from a film, uh, uh, Catchy came out in 1984 by Robert Townsend. Uh, it's a really, inter really funny film actually called Hollywood Shuffle. I don't know why we leaving Mouse and Hobbs. He been good to us. He feed us on Saturday, clothes us on Sunday, and then beat us on Monday. Or was it Tuesday? I, I don't know. Jasper, I said wants to go. I was a house nigga, Jasper. What? Jasper, don't you want freedom? We going to promise land. The promise land. Promise land? Cleveland? No, Jasper. Baltimore? No, Jasper, the promised land. Oh, the promised land. Minnesota? And cut. Hi, my name is Robert Taylor, and I'm a black actor. I had to learn to play these slave parts. And now you can too, at Hollywood's first black acting school. It teaches you everything. Learn jive talk 101. You motherfucking jive turkey motherfucker. All right, all right, that's good, that's good. You'll work, all right, you try it. You, you fucking mothers. Fucking no, 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 man, no, 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 that's wrong, that's wrong. Watch me. Just be cool. Jive turkey motherfucker. Go on, go on. That's only the beginning. You too can learn to walk black. No, 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 no rhythm. Observe. Yes, yes, yes. You too can be a black street hood. But this class is for dark-skinned blacks only. Light-skinned or yellow blacks don't make good crooks. Here's a student in our dance class. And it's still at TV. It just happened to be under my coat. 
I don't know nothing, policewoman. Kojak. Ironside. Yeah, I'm a gang leader. I'm in the warlords, the vice lords, the onion head. Let's talk to a graduate. This is Ricky Taylor. Ricky graduated from my class three years ago. Ricky, can you tell us what you've been doing since you've graduated? Well, Robert, I've played nine crooks, four gang leaders, two dope dealers. I played a rapist twice. Whoa. <laughs> that was fun. Currently, I, I'm filming a prison movie. I play this tough con that tries to fuck this new inmate. That sounds wonderful. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> Need I say any more? It's Hollywood's first black acting school. It teaches you everything. Classes are enrolling now. Learn to play TV pimps, movie muggers, street punks. Courses include Jive Talk 101, Shuffling 200, Epic Slaves 400, Dial 1 800 555 Coon. Don't try to be cool. Call Hollywood's first black acting school. Actually, I show this clip so many times that I laugh every time I, <laughs> I, I see it. Because it actually makes, the, I mean, it's a condensed way of making, uh, making that point about, about negative images, which is black people stuck within the stories written that come out of the nightmares of white scriptwriters. I've been trapped in someone else's story, trapped in, trapped in the imaginations of someone else. That's just in, I mean, that, that talks specifically about, uh, fic, about entertainment television and entertainment film, uh, especially in the news, especially local news. Uh, African Americans are disproportionately connected with crime. Um, uh, on network news as well, black people are disproportionately likely to be portrayed as criminal. In reality programming, and especially the cop programs, uh, like 911 and cops, etc., uh, that we, we see somehow that we see. Miss, we see in a disproportionate way the reality of, the reality of, uh, of, of black life. Uh, in, in, in programs like The Wire, in programs like The Shield or in Oz, presents minority communities as though they are literally a jungle. The urban jungle, literally a jungle. Um, in contemporary culture, I would say one of the major places this story of, uh, of blackness is told is in, uh, in, in hip-hop and commercial rap. And I know hip-hop and, and, and rap are a very wide uh, artistic form, but in the forms that have become popular in mainstream, the forms that are, that are commercial, commercially successful, um, the images tend to be quite narrow. This is from a film that I did called Dream Worlds 3, which, is, uh, which looks at this specifically. One of the genres where the voyeurism of girl-on-girl -girl action is a stable commodity is the world of male heterosexual pornography. And hip-hop and rap videos especially have increasingly come to closely resemble its form and its content. However, along with the voyeurism has come hatred, disrespect, and misogyny. While in the early years of music video, black women were virtually invisible, the widespread popularity of hip-hop has allowed their entry into this part of the culture. Though the price of entry is very high indeed, as they have literally been reduced to one part of their bodies. This is the essence of the commercial male heterosexual pornographic imagination, thinking about women as being defined only through their sexuality and that sexuality to be at the service of men's desires. The video Tip Drill by Nelly achieved a great deal of notoriety because it made explicit what is implicit in much of the rest of the culture, that women's bodies are there to solely please men and be under their control, to be bought and sold like so many pieces of meat. Here a woman's body is used to swipe a credit card, and indeed the term Tip Drill signifies a woman who will allow man after man to have sex with her for money. But this is not an isolated example, as the Snoop Dogg video shows. Indeed, many hip-hop videos are full of shots where money is showered on women's bodies, signaling that they are regarded with the contempt reserved for prostitutes and strippers, that their bodies and their sexuality can be bought and controlled by men. And while black men in mainstream rap and hip-hop videos are largely presented as violent, 
savage, criminal and drunken thugs interested in molesting and insulting any female that happens to be around. We have to remember that these representations do not reflect the reality of African American masculinity, but how someone has chosen to represent it at this point in history. As such, they constitute the most racist set of images found in many decades in American media and resemble most closely D.W. Griffith's 1915 white supremacist film, Birth of a Nation, where blacks are portrayed as irresponsible drunken buffoons and as out-of-control lust-filled rapists of white women. And just as it was a powerful white man who created and controlled those images as an argument for white supremacy and the glorification of the Ku Klux Klan, we have to focus our attention on these contemporary images of a threatening and out-of-control black masculinity and the role played by the largely white men who control our current media empires. We have to ask, what function do the racist and sexist images in hip-hop and rap perform for the corporations who control our media culture? I just, I, 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 as I said there, I think if you wanted to get a we wanted to compare contemporary images of black masculinity, uh, black masculinity in particular, uh, I think Birth of a Nation actually would be a really good starting point, <laughs> perhaps also uh, an end point. Now, we have to recognize also that these, uh, these images are not, um, are, are not uh, one-dimensional in terms of how they're made sense of. On the one hand, there is fear of these images, fear of these. At the same time, there is also a kind of drawing in. There's also, there's also an attraction to these images as well. Uh, this is brought out very well in, um, this is uh, uh, the, the uh, title sequence from a film called Office Space. Is there is this dialectic of adoration and fear at the same time. At the same time, these images are images of fear. <laughs> They're also images of attraction as well. And again, these, the, the, the mark of blackness doesn't work in any kind of simple way. Uh, and actually, if you, could answer, if you could answer this question, you would be going a long way to <laughs> figuring out the kind of psychoanalytical dimensions of what's happening around us. Why does, why does America seemingly love black culture, which is everywhere, but hate black people? in the policies that it pursues. If you can figure out that dialectic, if you can figure out that relationship, that will tell you a great deal about, one, one to tell you something about how, um, about how race operates. Uh, research has shown, in, in terms of how these images work, research has shown that when whites are shown pictures of black faces, even for like a millisecond, the part of their brains that respond to perceived threats light up almost instantaneously. The mark of blackness is threatening. The mark of blackness is, a, is about fear. It's about fear. It's about danger. And that, I would say, is the predominant story around, around race. Now, in the last uh, uh, tw 20 years or so, there's another story that has emerged. Okay, and this is the story. So that's story number one. Don't, you, don't want you to forget about story number one. Right? That's going to be that as part of this environment. Those stories... Those discourses pumping out day after day after day, exposed to those stories about blackness. The second story is a story of black affluence and success. This is Edith Bunker, at least, talking about this in the early 1980s. You never told us how you feel about black people. Well, you sure got to hand it to them. I mean, two years ago, there was nothing but servants and janitors. Now they're teachers and doctors and lawyers. They've come a long way on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I 
They have. They've come a long way on TV, <laughs> as Edith says there. In fact, since the mid-1980s, there's developed another set of images, what are sometimes called more positive images, in which black people are presented as having moved into the middle class and the upper middle class. Lots of black characters now who are not shown, who are in prime time, who are not just shown as criminals and pimps um, and as, uh, as, as muggers or connected to crime, but are now holding professional jobs like doctors and lawyers and all kinds of other things. There's been an explosion of the black middle class. It's been what, what has been termed, uh, the, in the 1980s was termed the Cosby decade and reflected the impact that many people thought that Bill Cosby had made on this. In fact, I think we can talk about a pre-Cosby moment and a post-Cosby moment in the representations of black America. And I think actually it is this, I think it's this story that Obama very explicitly and very deliberately, I think, has played upon. Without, without actually without Cliff Huxtable, I don't think Barack Obama would have been possible. And I mean that culturally. Some people have claimed that actually without you know, Sidney Poitier, you wouldn't have had Barack Obama and, and in his coolness he may, but I actually think oh, Cosby, Cosby, was the, Cosby is the real inspiration behind the image of, behind the image of Obama. Yeah, and, and on the one hand, there is the reaction of uh, black Americans to these new representations, incredible gratitude for these new representations. Uh, Lena Horne, the jazz singer, said once when introducing Cosby, she said, Dr. Cosby, she said, thank you, Dr. Cosby, for giving us back ourselves. That is, for too long, the images of black Americans have been stolen by white scriptwriters in Hollywood. And you've given us, you've given our image back to ourselves. You've given an image of decency, an image of respect. And I think you can, I think on election night, you could see some of this, you know, the crying faces, um, the crying faces of people in the, in the civil rights uh, generation, people like Jesse Jackson. And I don't think you can accuse Jesse Jackson of being overly romantic about these things. Uh, he knows about the reality, but, he, but this, this, he, 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 he kind of realized that the, 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 the election of Obama was something different. There was something, there was something new here. Uh, and there's no doubt that this is, for, for black Americans, this is a powerful and a real need. Uh, the, we actually did, a, um, my, my colleague Justin Lewis and I, um, in, in, in the late 1980s, we actually did a study on The Cosby Show. Because, in fact, we were interested to know, okay, what impact has The Cosby Show had on how people thought about race? And so we did what's called an audience study, where we, uh, we it wasn't just an analysis of the show, of the, of, of the content of the show, but we actually talked to uh, both black and white Americans about what they made of the show and how it impacted their understanding of race. And I'll refer to that uh, as I go through this. And I think actually if, I did a, if, I did a, if we did a similar study today on Obama, I think we would find very similar things. I think we are actually looking at, uh, looking at the, same, the same dynamic. The reaction to the Cosby show actually tells us a great deal. And, by, and it wasn't just the Cosby show. Let me make that clear. What Cosby made possible was the expansion of the black middle class across the whole range of television. Okay, when, when network executives don't have a clue what works, when something does work, they copy it endlessly. So when Cosby worked, okay, now we can, and so that's what led to the expansion of uh, the explosion of black professionals across the whole range of primetime television. What Cosby did, and it is, it is an incredible, I, mean, it's, I think what Cosby, uh, the, the success of the Cosby show, tells us not only about race, tells us something about race, but it also tells us a lot about social class. And without understanding class, you can't understand how race operates. Uh, the, the reaction to Cosby tells us a great deal about what is considered normal within our society. And we have to ask, how did Cosby make black people normal? Because that's what he did. He made black people normal. He made them respectable. He made them decent. How did he do it? He did it by making them abnormal in the reality of the actual experience of black Americans. Okay, not, that there are, there not, not that there is not a professional, black professional class. Of course there is. There has always been a black professional class. When you have, when you have segregation the way, we, the way we had it, then those societies had to develop their own classes. 
They had to develop their own doctors. They had to develop people in those professional models. So there's always been, there's always been a professional aspect, a middle class, upper middle class aspect of the black experience. But what Cosby did, and to make black people normal, that is what he had to represent. He had to represent that reality. In fact, a lot of people talked about the, uh, talked about the normality of the Huxtables. They liked their normality. They liked the fact that, um, uh, that, that, that you know, they were normal. And the way that Cosby did that was by making them... Sometimes people say, yeah, Cosby made them white. No. Uh, Cosby made... They were black. People, our, black, our white audiences, loved the fact of their blackness. Loved the black art on the wall. Loved the jazz. Loved the, the black speech patterns. He didn't make them white. He made them middle class. And he had to do that, and he did that because that is what is normal on television. That is what is normal on television. Most characters on television are middle class. Cosby didn't invent this, that's just the reality of having an advertising-based system whereby the representations shown on television have to be much richer and have to fit in with the world of advertising. You can't have this dichotomy between the world of, between the glamorized world of advertising and programming, and so the programming has to reflect the reality of a very small segment of the population. To be working class on television is to be a negative thing. It is to place yourself on the margins. And what I mean by working class, I don't mean, I don't mean the underclass. I mean the mass of respectable working class people. People who work in factories or in service occupations or as clerks in offices who live in small apartments, live from paycheck to paycheck, that reality, the reality of the vast majority of the population, both black and white, do not, it does not get represented on television. And when it does, it is represented in a negative way. You can count on the numbers of one hand, the number of regular working class characters on prime time television in the last decade or two decades. You do Roseanne, you do Rock, you do, and then you start kind of, then you start, gra- then you start, you know, uh, uh, grabbing at, grabbing at other things. When they do appear, oftentimes, when the working class does appear, they often are actually presented as clowns, or as fools, or as the butts of jokes. But in the Co- in the post Cosby era, there are many black professionals on primetime television. As Edith says, uh, they've done very well on TV. But again, their introduction has to be in a very particular, their introduction is a very particular kind of um, um, uh, a story that has to be told. And the story is them, is of a non-threatening nature. Okay, it's got to be non-threatening. And that's actually exactly, it, it, it is this version of, of blackness that Obama has literally wrapped himself in. This is the connection between Obama and uh, Obama and Cosby. Excuse me, I think I'm just. So, some more. Uh, this is the, again our best, our best uh, news program talking about this connection between Cosby and Obama. Opponents paint him as a Marxist radical with dreams of unchallenged power. His rhetoric is high-minded and centrist. His policies fall somewhere in between in a bizarre melange. We're joined by senior Obamalist Wyatt Sinek. Uh, Wyatt. <laughs> who, who is Barack Obama? It's simple. He's Cliff Huxtable. <laughs> From the Cosby Show? No, the other Cliff Huxtable. Of course from the Cosby Show. How is he, how is he Cliff Huxtable? Well, for starters, they're both married to hot lawyers, <laughs> both work out of offices on the west side of their houses, and both have unrealistically cute daughters. So it it's, it's, doesn't say anything about who the man is. That's a, a coincidental uh, matching up of superficial facts. It, it, coincidental something of the what? <laughs> Look. What sayeth you to this? Remember when Stevie Wonder played at the White House? 
That's straight from The Cosby Show, season two, episode 18. Say how much I care. You probably know it as a touch of wonder. No, I don't know it as that. I don't. What difference does that make? They both like Stevie Wonder. I like Stevie Wonder. So what? Oh, and I suppose they both love jazz musicians stopping by, like Esperanza Spaulding at the White House, or Tito Puente and Friends, episode 17, season 2, or have old black dudes show up to their houses and do Shakespeare in their living rooms. Noble and approved good masters. I am Caesar. <laughs> And I guess Obama got the idea to beat girls in basketball because he's a completely different person than Cliff Huxtable. This little White House scene is straight out of episode 19, season 5. Game, set, match. What the f*** are you talking about? This is, so he's Cliff Huxtable. How does that... How does that help us understand who he is? How does that help us? Because now we know how his presidency goes. The Cosby Show ran for eight seasons. That's two terms. Two terms. That is weird. It was eight. It was, it was literally eight seasons. That is weird. Eight seasons, two terms. How will the bank bailouts go? John, it's in the pilot episode. I'm going to give you $300 a week. Yes, indeed. $300 a week, $1,200 a month. All right? Great, I'll take it. Yes, you will. Sound familiar? <laughs> will it be a successful presidency? Inevitably, ratings will slip and they'll make mistakes, like Secretary of Energy Raven Simone. <laughs> sure, she's cute, but she's no Rudy. Why would you throw Rudy under the bus? It's just puberty. She's still the same Rudy. Are you all right? Are you all right? Uh, you know, it's... I'm sorry, it's... It's just like all lame duck presidents, I guess. You know, wandering the rose garden, uh -huh. all... Hey there, Joe Biden, you want some pudding pops? You see, the economy, it's doing okay since the bank stress test, you know. Rudy understands what to mean when you do the stuff that you do with the cyber sleeve superstar. Uh, it is, actually, it's more than just these surface, <laughs> surface connections. And I think, actually, if you look down into it, what, what, what Obama has done, he has wrapped himself in his, as Tim Y says, in his inner Huxtable. That is what he has channeled in this. Um, how has he done this? I mean, as I said, this notion of the non-threatening aspect is absolutely central. And we have to understand the deal, if you want to understand Obama, you have to understand the deal that Cosby made as well with his white audience, not his black audience. Okay, but you can't become a number one show by just being popular with a black audience. You've got to be popular with everyone, including, I mean, especially the white audience. So how is that done? Well, it is done by offering this Faustian bargain. He appeared... In on, when he was on, he appeared like a priest every Thursday, forgiving the sins of the past. Forgiving the sins of the past. Making them an offer they couldn't refuse. This is from Harper's Magazine um, uh, describing this. They say, and I think actually gets to the central aspect, they say, his vast audience knows that Cosby will never assault their innocence with racial guilt. Racial controversy is all but banished from the show. The Huxtable family never discusses affirmative action. Okay, the only time actually, so the only time uh, race actually made any, any kind of introduction, any uh, you know uh, uh, part of the content was when they were talking about the march of poor people, poor people's march in uh, in Washington in what, 1962 or whatever it was. It was actually done as a day out. And the stories that was told was about you know, this day out that, that, that Cosby and, uh, and his family had at that time going to this march. Now, but it's in the past. Right? If you're going to have it, it's in the past. It's not in the present. And it is this kind of nostalgic view of what civil rights was about. 
So nostalgic that, as Chris Wallace can say, he was part of the civil rights movement now. He then says, the bargain Cosby offers his white viewers, I will confirm your racial innocence if you accept me, is a good deal for all concerned. Not only does it allow whites to enjoy Cosby's humor with no loss of innocence, but it actually enhances their innocence by implying that race is not the serious problem for blacks that it once was. On Thursday nights, Cosby, like a priest, absolves his white viewers, forgives and forgets the sins of the past. He tells his white viewers each week that they are okay and that this black man is not going to challenge them. Obama has done, has had to do, I mean, I, he actually had no option. Obama has done essentially exactly the same thing. Discourses of racism are absent from his discourse. And just the way that Cliff Huxtable can't talk about race in open ways, neither can, neither can Obama. The one time, you may remember, it's actually the one time he was forced to deal with race in the election. One time he was forced to deal with it was around, in the controversy around his former pastor, Jeremiah Wright. When, he became, when Jeremiah Wright's uh, comments became controversial. And it's a, famous, it's a very famous speech that Obama made, and I would recommend anyone who wants to understand how this dynamic works, I would recommend the speech to you as, a, as an example of how, of how you can Cosbify. I don't know if this, that's a word, but of how you can, you can huxtalize <laughs> your understanding of race. It's a remarkable document. It's constructed in a way to speak to white voters and to comfort them with the knowledge that he is not going to threaten them around race. It's his most elaborate, uh, it's his most elaborate um, kind of discussion around race and it's worth, um, it's worth reading just for that. That is, he is not Reverend Wright. He is not Reverend Wright. The speech does a number of things. On the one hand, it recognizes past racial injustices. Yes, racism was here, but it's in the past. Like the March on Washington. It's in the 60s, you know, a long time ago. It positions Reverend Wright as an angry black man in relation to these injustices. But that angry black man wants to stress division. Reverend Wright wants to tear us apart. In contrast with this, Right. Yes, there was racism. Yes, it was, and, then, and, Reverend, and Reverend Wright is living in the past, and that's why he's so angry, and he wants to divide us. In contrast to this, Obama wants to move forward in unity and in consensus and without confrontation. He recognizes white fears about affirmative action and says that whites may have lost jobs because of preferential treatment against them. He has to say things that he knows are not true to appeal to white voters. He has to say, he has to say okay, this, there is a problem with affirmative action. It reaffirms the American dream, anyone can make it. Look, I made it, anyone can make it. And it tells blacks, tells black Americans, to take full responsibility for their lives by spending more time with their kids. Again, okay. um, I wouldn't say self-blame, but, but, but self-responsibility. And then it says, things have gotten much better. Racism is in the past. We are now in a different period. We haven't quite got there yet. We haven't quite got there, but the end is in sight. We just have one more, right? The promised land is in sight. And we will get there soon. We will get there soon. Just need to get over that last hurdle. As I said, it is a masterful speech in how it's constructed. And in one sense, let me make clear, in one sense, it was the only thing that he could have done. For him to succeed with a predominantly white audience around issues of race, it is the only way he could have framed it. He could not have been honest. He could not have dealt, dealt with the reality of race. To do so would have immediately marginalized him and he would have, he would have lost even to the incompetent candidates that Republicans put up last time. He would have lost because of race. 
In that sense, he knew exactly. I he, mean, he had he had learned the lesson of he learned the lesson of Cosby. Actually, it also helped. I mean, if you look at popular culture, it also helped that people had already seen what a black president looked like in popular culture. Okay, Morgan Freeman in the film Deep Impact. He's our first black president. <laughs> Actually, Morgan Freeman plays these roles, right? He's either God or the president, one of the... It's, I guess there's worse things that you could be. Or Dennis Haysbert in 24. Again, a black, competent president. So Obama wasn't something new. It, the, the ground had been prepared. Cosby, <laughs> Morgan Freeman, Dennis Haysbert. It wasn't such a... It wasn't such a... Especially when there is no hard and fast... This vision between fiction and reality when it's part of that symbolic world. The third story, so those two stories. Story one, black crime, problems. Story two, the story of black affluence, non-threatening. And there is a third story. This is the story of classlessness and the American dream. Okay, what is class? Um, I, I have a very simple definition of class. Class is, are the so economic and social conditions within which we live and into which we are born. Class refers to things like access to wealth, access to education, access to housing, access to culture. And we know that our class origins have an impact on where we will end up. We know that our class origins impact social mobility in very, very powerful ways. And the culture tells us essentially two stories about class. Firstly, it tells us that class does not exist, that we are all essentially middle class. When people are asked to identify themselves, even people who, by any obje objective definition, are in the working classes, they identify themselves as middle class. Because working class is negative. And to, pre and to present yourself as just regular working people is, present is, a, is, a, is, a, is a negative self-identification. And so people who earn anything from you know, $25,000 to $120,000 regard themselves as middle class. That essentially means it's a meaningless term. Not ideologically, but in reality, if you, I mean, it's a meaningless term to describe when, it, when it's that broad. But essentially, we think that class doesn't exist. Europeans have, have social class. But we are a classless society. Classless society. The second story that he tells us is that when, because it is a ridiculous story to tell, because we know the reality of class. When we see the reality of class, tells us that they can be overcome. This is a story of the American dream. That anyone, regardless of birth, can make it. That class barriers can be overcome. That hard work and talent are all you need. And the media continually tell us these stories about the, tra about the transformation based on, on hard work. Okay, this, of course, is the polar opposite of what any so social scientist who studies social mobility will tell you. And they will tell you that class matters. That access, the two, the, two, the two major things that determine people's success in life, your life chances of a socioeconomic success, are your parents' occupation and your level of education. Statistically speaking, class matters. It would be a very weird capitalist society if class didn't matter, by the way, when the central, when the central organizing principle of the society is, is, is supposed to be non-existent or, or doesn't determine anything. And then deep down, we all know that class matters. We all know that class matters. And we all know that where we start up will determine, in a very important way, where we end up. Now, with these three stories, okay, story one, crime and violence, Story two, black affluence and success. Story three, classlessness and the American dream. That's the discourse. Okay, that's what's floating. That's, those are the stories floating in this environmental discourse, this symbolic discourse about how we understand the differences of hair, skin, and bone. And the question then is, how do those stories interact with each other? How do they interact with each other? With these stories... Okay, let's come back to the beginning of my talk. With these stories, we are now asked to make... These are the stories inside our heads. Okay, these are the, the stories. This is race as a psychological construct. 
as a, as a cultural construct. With these stories, we now have to make sense of the reality of race outside of our heads. How do we understand? How do we understand it? Well, there are, so that's, what these are, it's, it's, that's the interaction between them. We have to figure out the interaction between them. It's not one story or the other. There are at least three possible answers to the problem of black poverty. At least three answers. There may, there may, be, there may be more. If you, want, if you want to explain why, this, why, the, why the ghetto looks like it does, you want to explain black underachievement, you want to explain black incarceration, if you want to explain all those things, and that's the reality, then there are a number of different, different ways you could explain it. You could explain it via racism. You could say racism exists. There are racial barriers, legal barriers that prevent pe black people from making it. Legal political barriers. Okay, it, was this, it was this system that was in place in the South for, for, for a long, long time. Um, still maybe is the inspiration for the civil rights movement. Um, you know, but does it explain, does racism explain <laughs> the existence of a black middle class? Does it explain the existence of Barack Obama? If it was about racism, how can we have a black president? He is, he is proof, in one sense, that racism is a thing of the past. A second explanation, and this is the explanation that I would give, would be, in fact, that class barriers keep the majority of black people where they are. That racism deposited black people at the bottom of the economic scale, and that class has kept them there recognizes both racism historically and also recognizes even if you were to get rid of the legal barriers around racism, that those barriers manifest themselves in these economic forms. The barriers of education, the barriers of culture, the barriers of income will keep, will, 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 will um, reproduce the contours of black poverty. William Julius Wilson, in a very misunderstood book, uh, talked about this, where he talked about um, the, 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 the declining significance of race. I mean, what he meant by that was not that racism didn't, didn't exist. What he meant by that was actually it's race and class that you have to understand together. And the class actually, social class, it actually is a much more fundamental category to understand the existence of the black underclass or black poverty. As I said, it's the, it's, the, it's the example, that it's the, it's the answer that I would give. And I think actually it's the, it's the answer that most sociologists would give as to why we have, why we continue to structure our social economic lives along the differences of hair, skin, and bone. It could also be a third answer. The third answer is the cultural racial answer, which is actually, you know, there's something about those black people at the bottom. There's something about those black people in prison. There's something about those black people in the ghetto. There's something about those black people who don't make it out of school. There's something about their culture. There's something about their culture. There's something about themselves. There's something about that they have not done. So anytime you hear any, any stories around the culture of poverty, that's, that's the code word for this. The code word for the culture of, the code word, the culture of poverty is a code word for self-blame. Self-blame. If poor blacks would just get it together, they would just be able to lift themselves up by their own bootstraps and, 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 and make it. But they just don't. They can't. They're not as intelligent. They're not as hardworking. They're... So which answer? Well, can't be racism. We're told the civil rights movement took care of that. And look at all these affluent black people in on across the range of television. And look at our black president. Can't be class, <laughs> because we don't have class. By definition, it can't be that. So it leaves what? Has to be this racial answer. It is black people themselves that are to blame for the problems that they find themselves in. They are lazy. They're not as intelligent. They don't work as hard. They name their kids stupid names. That's the Cosby answer, by the way. Right, that's what Cosby has said. That's the racial answer, their own fault. Those blacks have not adopted a different culture, i.e. a white culture. It's the way that some black commentators themselves 
have diagnosed the situation. This is the black conservative Shelby Steele. And I want you to just, and I'm going to give you the analysis, I want you to think, of, just think about how, these, of, of what, of how he can construct it in this way. He says, talking about Detroit, the, inner, the decay of the inner city of Detroit, he says, 20 years of decline and demoralization, even as opportunities for blacks to better themselves have increased. By many measures, the majority of blacks, those not yet in the middle class, are further behind whites today than before the victories of the civil rights movement. Okay, this is the, if conditions have worsened for most of us, as racism has receded, then much of the problem must be of our own making. If conditions have got worse, as racism has got less, then we must be to blame. It is, a, it is of our own making. It is of our own making. The problem is, this is Shelby Steele, the problem is magnified for white Americans. Uh, according to a 2001 survey, 60% of white Americans admitted that they believe at at least one negative or racist stereotype of black people. That they are lazy, generally lazy, generally aggressive or violent, or prefer to live on welfare rather than work for a living. Other studies have found that whites believe lower class blacks to have a character flaw, which amounts to a belief that blacks lack the appropriate work ethic, or just don't want to try hard enough, or lack the necessary motivation or values in some way. Two thirds of white Americans in one survey said that disadvantages suffered by blacks was due to their dependence on welfare. This is self-blame of, of, of an incredible uh, uh, scale. Okay, this is from a study actually that was done in the 1990s. It's a very interesting study. It was actually run by two advertising people. And the study was called The Day America Told the Truth. And they came up with a methodology whereby people would be, would be encouraged to say things that they believed, but they never normally say because it's not... You know, they, 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 it's not considered respectable to say it. So they figured out a way to get people to really say the truth. And they say about race, and they were shocked by this. They say, in the 1990s, white Americans hold blacks and blacks alone to blame for their current position in American society. We try to help whites say over and over, but blacks wouldn't help themselves. This is the basis of what we, of what we call the new racism. Everything flows from it. It is a change from the hardcore racism that existed in our country's early years. It is also a dramatic contrast to the attitudes of the 1960s when many whites, from the president on down, publicly stated that black people were owed compensation for centuries of oppression. So the, the, these are two advertising um, uh, people from, uh, uh, who wrote this book called The Day America Told the Truth. In our, in our own book, when we, asked, uh, we wanted to figure out what the, how people thought about race, uh, people will never tell you what they think about race in, in a survey or in a focus group. So you have to ask them something else. You have to ask them some other question that is about race, but which you know they have opinions about. And so what we did was we asked questions about affirmative action as a program. What do people think about affirmative action? And affirmative action is, you know, is a story about racism. And if you believe in it, you believe that racism still exists. If you don't believe in it, you believe that racism is a thing of the past. And our, our respondents kept saying that, kept saying, affirmative action was needed, but it's no longer needed. We used to need it, but we don't need it anymore, therefore, because racism is a thing of the, of the past. Why are blacks at the bottom of the ladder? They put themselves there. They are to blame themselves. Remember, in our study, the people who said this were also fans of the Cosby Show. These were people who loved the Cosbys or the Huxtables, invited them into their homes every Thursday night, interacted, loved these people in a very deep way, actually. It's not just they thought about them as family members or as friends. But at the same time, held these views of, 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 uh, of why the majority of blacks did not succeed. In our, the, the, book we, the book we wrote was we entitled it Enlightened Racism. It's a new form of racism. It's not the racism of, of old. It is new. I love black people. I love black culture. I love the art. I love, I, I love hip-hop. I love the jazz. I love, but these most of the, the but, you know, black people in the, in the inner city, they just need to get their act together. 
They just need to work harder. So you can hold, you can, you can hold views based on race while thinking that you are not racist. You are enlightened, but still hold these views at the same time. And that is different than, than the racism of the past. Tim Wise, in, in, his, in that horribly titled book I gave you before, has called it enlightened exceptionalism. And in fact, Obama, right? <laughs> Obama fits in exactly the same category. There are, in a survey done in September of 2008, just before the election, 60% of white Americans admitted holding negative characteristics, negative views about black people in general, but planned to vote for Obama. Because he wasn't like that. Because he was a different type of black person. Or to put, or more explicitly, uh, an email that what Tim Wise received just before the election from a young white man. And, the, and the, the email said he wanted Obama to win so that the nation would finally be able to, quote, stop talking about racism and move on to more important subjects. And so that blacks would have to stop whining about discrimination and focus on pulling themselves up by their bootstraps instead. That's what, that's what Obama would make possible, that kind of discourse. Okay, the danger of what I call the Huxley strategy, this is... The danger of the Huxley strategy for white people is it provides relief from fear of black people, uh, from fear of black people, and even allows identification with some black people. Right? That's that's the cause. I love Bill Cosby. I love Obama. I love. I, I'm not. He doesn't make me scared. I don't have to be afraid of him. At the same time. <laughs> It also provides relief from responsibility and provides a feel-good way of not identifying with most, read real, black people. Of not identifying with the problems, with the problems of reality that I've laid out. How do I characterize this? Actually, and when I said we, we characterize the Cosby effect, because uh, we, we, it's not a simple effect. It's not, we can't just... We, we, we characterize this as one step forward, two steps back. Yes, you can identify with some black people, and in an age that we live in, that is a good thing. But the cost of that identification is that it, it causes disidentification with the vast majority of black Americans. And those are, that's the two steps back. Okay, this, is not about, believe me, this is not about Obama's policies. We could talk about what Obama's policies are um, uh, and what they are not. This is about the idea, this is about the idea of Obama, the idea of Obama. Um, and I'm not too sure Obama could have done anything different. If you wanted to be elected, this is, this is the catch-22. If, if, if you want to be elected within this context, this is the deal you have to make as a black politician. This is the deal you have to make. Actually, it will be interesting. You can ask uh, Cory Booker next week about how, uh, this, 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 how, how this impacts uh, black politicians. He could not, he's trapped. Obama himself is trapped within this discourse that he cannot control. That he cannot, and I'm sure if he... Actually, I'm not sure, actually. I'm, I was going to say I'm sure he has a different understanding. He, he, he would like to talk about race in a different way. That's actually an open question. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if he would like to talk about race in a different way. But it's in this way. It's going to be, I think it's going to be ironic. I mean, essentially, it, it's, not, it's, it's not about... The, it's, it's, a, it's where illusion, the illusion of race, the illusion of the illusion of the story that a black man can tell about what blackness means. It's that, it's that symbolic story, it's that, symbol, that illusory story that is the most effective. Chris Hedges has a new book, which I would highly recommend to everyone, um, called Empire of Illusion. An empire of illusion is this empire, <laughs> is us right now. I mean, in that sense, I think actually Obama may be the perfect candidate for a empire of illusion. Again, I'm not sure, that this is, 
I'm not sure what else Obama could have done because it is not actually Obama's fault in the same way it is not Cosby's fault. It is the fault of the society. If you want to put, it's the, it's the problem of the society. It's the problem of, it's, the, it's our problem of refusing to deal with race. It is our problem of refusing to deal with our most intractable problems. It is our problem of being dishonest. It is our problem of, of, of wanting to be flattered and of not dealing with the harsh realities that we have to face. Can we, can we figure out a way out of that? That will depend upon whether we, in the political realm, whether we insist upon being treated like children and being flattered and not threatened, or whether we will engage in hard discussion, hard and real discussion of our of our real issues. Actually, and that's not that's the case with racism. It's also the case with, with almost. Every, well, we can, can can we face our financial crisis in its reality? Can we face climate change in its reality, rather than in the stories that are told about it? In that sense, the sto- the, 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 the 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 action that, that what I would recommend is actually not. I don't think Obama can do anything different. He will only do something different if he is forced to do something different by social forces that are not under his control. By social forces not on the right, social forces on the left that force him to become honest. And I think he really does want to be honest. I think he would like to engage in, he's not a simple guy. We know he's complex in everything that he does. He has to be, if he is the kind of if he is the lightning rod, we have to pressure him to be. We have to pressure him to be the person we really want to solve these problems. Uh, thank you. I've gone on for way too long here. We'll take questions. If you're able to line up over here, that's helpful. If you cannot, wave and I'll come to you. I'm wondering if anybody had ever answered a question that uh, James Baldwin once asked on television some years ago about uh, why, why a sort of land of liberty, you know, hope of the world and all that, you know, the city on the hill, the le- uh, well, just why you had to, there was why you had to have a nigger. I'm professing to, America professing to believe what it does, why you need a nigger. You got because you needed him. You got to find out why. Yeah, I uh, met him shortly afterward at uh, book signing session at the First Baptist Church. I wish I'd asked him that question. Yeah, that's uh, <clears throat> that's what always bothered me. You know, practice of race with our, what, what what we profess. What's the equation between them? Uh, that's a very good question. I wish, oh, I wish I could even attempt to try and answer. But you know. I mean, race, it's, it, it is the, it, the, the idea of, you know, the city on the hill, the idea, I mean, it, that's the idea of America, right, on the one hand. The idea of America, which is, and I actually think it's a fine idea to some degree. Well, that's the, the reality then is, what is that city built on? What is the city, of, city, of, the city on the hill built on? What is, what, what is the reality that's underlying it as well? And it's again, that, if you, it's, I think you have to be, the, the question is you have to be honest about what it takes. If you want to, if, if you want to really, and you know, politicians have used that notion of the city on the hill. That is the ideal, right? It's, the, it's, it's what to strive towards. What does that, as, a, as an idea, it's a great, it's a, you know, a, a, 
It's, it's a symbolic idea. How does, but how can that be recon, reconciled? Sorry, how can that be reconciled then with the history of racism, with the history of black Americans, with the history of slavery, which is the, which is the forgotten word when it comes to, when it, when it comes to, um, uh, you know, to discussions around these things. And until we can have that discussion, I think that's the honest discussion. Right? That's the honest discussion that somehow we have to be able to inaugurate. Keep asking. <laughs> Uh, hey, thanks. Um, I want to preface this with saying that I hate the Tea Party, as do you. But I've always wondered why in, well, I guess not always, they've only been around for like a year and a half. But for the past year and a half, I've wondered why um, people on the fringe on the right and people on the fringe on the left are treated so differently. Specifically, why um, on the left, they, people are subjugated and disenfranchised, where on the right, the rural poor are, in your words, crazy extremists. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, there's a very simple answer. is because there is a vast social movement that has targeted them and their anxieties around race and around economics. Uh, I mean, I, 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 mean I, I kind of mentioned at the start, you know, the relationship between the Tea Party movement and race. Uh, and I think it's absolutely fundamental. There's no, there's, there's no um, accident that when, when you look at, when you hear the Tea Party strategy or the Tea Party rhetoric, right, it's all about Obama is not American, Obama is a Muslim, Obama is a socialist, Obama is a communist, Obama is, he's not even born here, right, he's not even, he's not even black, he's, he's only half black. And so that idea of, I mean, he's, he's become... I mean, I, I talked about it a little bit in the, the, those of you who are at the afternoon sec session. I'll have to, <laughs> have to bear with me for a second. But it is the generalized, it's the, it's the generalized strategy that the Republicans and right, and I, again, I, I don't want to appear to be too, you know, one-dimensional, but it is, you can't, it is right-wing billionaires who have funded the Tea Party movement. It's people like, you know, Charles and David Koch who through you know, the, um, through groups like Americans for Prosperity, for Freedom Works, etc., have laid the groundwork for this incredibly regressive movement. And the way they've done it, I think, the, the major thing I would say, if you talk about the Tea Party and race, right, as I said at the beginning, it is a race-based movement. It is a movement of white people and disaffected white people. In that sense, it is a generalized strategy, what's called the Southern strategy, which the Republicans have been using for a long time, which is scare the hell out of white Americans by saying the blacks are coming for you. By, you know, they're, they're coming for you, they're coming for your children, they're coming for, you, for your house, they're coming. And if you can do that and get people to, to, to think about themselves in racial terms rather than in economic terms, well, then you can drag people into all kinds of places. And I think, I mean, how, how much more, that, for the Tea Party movement, what more evidence do you want that the blacks are coming to get you than there is a black president? The most powerful, powerful position in, in the country is, is occupied by, and that's why for them it's this, it's this conspiracy. Which is why I didn't talk about it so much, because that's, it, it's, when, when, again, listening to the rhetoric, and I, I was going to say I recommend listening to it, I actually don't recommend listening to it, it's really painful to listen to. But you have to understand what's going on there. You have to understand, you have to understand how racial identity is being targeted. You have to understand how, how economic anxiety is being targeted. And if I had to look, if I had to, again, not to, I know people will roll their eyes as soon as I say this, but if you wanted to look back in history to a similar kind of time, you know, look back into Nazi Germany as to how you can turn disaffection and target it on a specific people and make them, and I mean the, 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 the level of Islamophobia right now. I mean you can say things about Muslim people now that it, it, it's just, you couldn't say about any other people. It, it is now, it is part of the mainstream. And Obama has become a kind of representative of that, right? He is, he is Muslim. 
An economic crisis can as easily go in a progressive direction as it can in a regressive direction. And that's exactly what happened in... Remember, remember when, when Nazi Germany happened? Okay, this isn't some small third world, you know, regressive nation. Germany was at the height of European civilization. In philosophy, in culture, in academia, it, 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 was, the height of Amer it was the height of European culture. And yet, within a very short period, by, focus, by, by, by racializing it, and by targeting, in, in, Nazi, in, 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 in the case of Nazi Germany, it was Jews in which these stories are told over and over again. You have to protect yourselves against the Jews. They're coming for you. They're coming for you. Well, it's a similar thing here, except it, it's, it's, it, within the mainstream, it is done by the Republican Party through this thing called the Southern Strategy, which is to identify, which is to identify the opposition in terms of race. And the Fox, the, the, the Fox Network is doing this on a, daily, on a daily basis. But it is a very similar, it's a very similar type of thing that's, that's happening. Uh, again, the question I would, uh, the, what I would encourage people to do is really think about why Islamophobia and why now? Why Islamophobia and why now? Because what this can do is this can get, you know, there, remember in, in, in Nazi Germany, it wasn't all lunatics. The reason Nazi Germany worked, the reason Nazi Germany was successful was because many so-called good Germans did nothing. Stood by and saw what was happening and did nothing or identified with it. Or, but doing nothing is, in, this, in, in that present situation, doing nothing is tantamount to complicity. And when doing nothing around the rise of Islamophobia, again, if you, and if you looked at the, we, we've, we've done a film, we did a film on this. If you looked at the discourses around anti-Semitism and the discourses around Islamophobia now, they're almost identical. I mean, Muslims are the new Jews in terms of how, uh, in terms of how the image is constructed. And we know, we know actually where it could go without struggle. We know where it could go if people, if people of goodwill simply, I mean, again, it's a kind of, I wouldn't say ironic, but, you know, it's election night, and <laughs> who knows what's going to happen tonight. But it is an important, it is an important moment. Hi, thank you uh, for coming tonight. I've enjoyed this. Um, I'm an, an administrator uh, at a majority white school in the area, um, one of a few. And I just had a comment that I think that without putting, certainly not putting myself on the same level as Obama, I think the sort of dilemma or situation that you've described that Obama is in in his uh, attempt to speak on race uh, is very similar to the place that uh, I personally find myself as an administrator um, with that struggle of when to or if to tell the truth, or if I'm in a place where this is the best that I can do at this moment. And so I appreciate uh, understanding the stories that are going on in, and uh, better understanding the stories that are going on in folks' heads uh, and how that plays out with what's actually, you know, we see every day in our face. So uh, doesn't change, you know, that struggle. Um, but for folks trying to bring about change, I think they are in that very similar situation you described as Obama was in, given that speech. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, th I think that I mean it, it is, the dilemma is real, obviously, um, and that the question is always for me is always thinking strategically, which is thinking if you want to move things forward, how best to move them forward, and you have to, in that sense, identify and, and figure out what are the other discourses into which your own discourse will be, you know, will be will, will fit. And that will require creative thinking, trying to figure out, okay, how do we, within this discourse, how do you move it forward? Not how do you regress it, not how do you wipe people, not how do you shut people up, but how do you move it forward, even a little bit at a time? And that will require an analysis of, of, of the discourses that we've looked at. So, uh, good luck. We'll take just two more questions. Thank you for your fine talk. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned the Reverend Wright 
and Obama. There uh, did occur last summer, another incident I'd like your insight on. I think I can guess at it, though. That was the Gates-Crowley affair, uh, the conflict between the Harvard professor and the, and the white policeman that Obama got involved in and got criticized for. Your insight on that? <laughs> yeah, I think you should look at Obama's reaction to that in two ways. Firstly, his initial reaction, where he actually just reacted as a black man. He just reacted. He's like, oh, this is ludicrous. <laughs> right? And then he realized, actually, I don't know if he realized, his, his advisors realized what he did. Because in that moment, he was potentially changing how America looked at him because he responded in this kind of, he responded as a black man and responded to the, and then you, you realize very quickly he withdrew. Right? We responded very quickly, withdrew, and went into his kind of conciliatory mode because people, his, his advisors realized immediately what had happened. So I think you've got to look at it in those two, in those two modes. Then he was trying to rescue it. Then he was, you know, after that first thing, he was trying to rescue it. Uh, but, you know, Bill, Bill Cosby uh, immediately realized what he'd done wrong, uh, what Obama had done so wrong, what he'd done in terms of how the discourse was played out, uh, because he would have never done that. <laughs> but it shows that that's the, I mean, it, it was a moment when I think it was kind of honest. It was a raw emotion to start off with. And then realizing that you had to rescue it in this particular context. And then how do you do it? Well, you have to do it in a non-threatening way. I didn't really mean it. I overspoke. Or you know, bring people together for a beer. It's conciliatory, etc. And never have to deal with the real problem of profiling. And of how the differences of hair, skin, and bone make a difference even if you're Henry Louis Gates. And in your own home. That would, it could have been a teachable moment. Right? With, a di with, with someone with, with a different, in, a, in a different mode, for a different president, who is not subject to these conditions, it could have been a teachable moment. And it didn't. It didn't become a teachable moment. We lost that moment. Um, I, I said I was hopeful when it first happened, and then the more he withdrew, it was like, okay, this is, <laughs> his advisors have got to him. Yeah, I want to thank you very much for coming tonight. I learned a lot. Thanks. Um, I have a question. You said about moving Obama and those in the progressive community to, to help to move him along. And that's a real quandary for some people. He came here to Rhode Island uh, this past week or week and a half, and um, there was a demonstration um, against his policies, like in a, you know, Afghanistan or Honduras or other, other things. And there was a real debate whether, whether to go because you're caught in this quandary because the Tea Party people would show up and you don't want to be a part of that and you want to be part of that type of criticism and that, part of, and that type of racism. And on the other hand, uh, those of us that are opposed to the war and so forth are really upset about that and really want to move him to... So there's that quandary about progressives really taking a stand against some of his policies and how that, and how that plays out. I wondered if you could uh, get a little more into that sure. for me. Um, Thank you. I mean, I think like everything else, you have to be strategic on this. And I think right now is most probably not the time for that kind of opposition at this moment. The time for it would have been and can still be again. And some, I've, I've heard people like you know, Tariq Ali you know, talk about this and about what, what progressives should have done. I mean, remember, recognize that moment. of the, the, I mean, the election night was an incredible moment. I, I don't want to downplay it. Okay, and you know, people read into that moment, whatever. But it was a moment when you know, young people who had never taken part in politics saw a different kind of future, where all kinds of people came together. And I think that the Obama as an idea on election day was an incredibly strong idea. And that's exactly why the Tea Party moved so... That's why, exactly why the right and the Kochs moved so quickly. What had to be suppressed was not the reality of Obama, who, which is no different than most... Um, you know, mainstream Democrats, what had to be suppressed was the idea of Obama, was the idea that he encapsulated, which is people could have a say in their own lives, that people could be active in their own lives, that people could be moved to participate. That was, it's, it's actually what I call an FDR moment. You have to make sure that Obama didn't become FDR and part of a social movement. And that's why the reaction to him was so strong. That, that, that's someone, what I think should have happened um, uh, and I think it's, this is not the time. What should have happened is um, you know, should have, people should have gone along to the inauguration, 
celebrated what was, it was again an incredible, right? <laughs> incredible, people went to the inauguration, right, it was a celebration of, you know, the end of eight years of Bush and, you know, the, the, this horrible nightmare that people were stuck in. And the inauguration itself was incredibly moving. I mean, the, the concert that he had there, you know, Pete Seeger played at the concert. He right? played at the concert. This land is your land in its, in, in its political version was sung at the inauguration by Seeger. Okay, I mean, I, I, when I was happening, I, you know, Springsteen bringing, you know, bringing Seeger on, and I mean, it was incredibly, right? We should have celebrated that and built upon that, because not, not on, built on the idea of what, what was represented in that moment. The idea that was so threatening to the right. The idea of progressivism, the idea of participation, the idea of diversity. That I mean, all those things that were, and then the day after the inauguration, there should have been a massive anti-war march in Washington directed at Obama saying, okay, let's get now, let's, let, let's, deal, with, let's deal with policies. And if that had happened, we would, he, would have been, he would have had to react to the left as well as the right. Instead, what happened was the left all went home. We didn't do that. We didn't, do, we didn't pressurize him, even though he said, pressurize me. He realized you know, the reason FDR moved in the direction he did was not because he wanted to move in that direction, but because there was these incredibly strong social movements, these, you know, the union movement and the, the cooperative movement, etc. That was, that was there was forcing him in that direction, and we never did that. And I think that's the lesson we've learned. Now is not that I think after, well, actually now, from now on is the moment to do that. It's not to be in a defensive mode around it, but it's to say, how, what can you do to move Obama I think not only in a progressive direction, but in a winning direction, in a populist direction that actually can win. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm, for me, Obama is a mainstream Democrat. Right? He's not, a, he's not a radical. He's not. No, I mean, he was. You know, the, 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 he worked. You know, that that the night. You know, he won election because he was kind of a you know a raw shock ink block test. You could read into him whatever you wanted, right? <laughs> he, was a, he was a community activist, he was a civil rights leader, he was a socialist, he was a community, you know, he was all these things. And, and then, he had to, then he had to govern. What, what should have happened, or, and I think we have now looked, what needs to happen now is that pressure needs to be put on. We have to counter the discourses of the right. The Tea Party has to be, has to be, um, has to be countered and fought. At the same time, the pressure has to be put on Obama. Doing it last week, I think, is too late. In, right before this election, I think that's, you know, there's too much at stake right now. But tomorrow isn't, and the day after that isn't. So again, my, my advice would be to, to think with that in mind as to how to move people forward and where you want them, is to always participate, always put that pressure on, and to think strategically about what's the best way of doing that. Okay, thank you.